Good morning and Happy New Year. Here we are, 2022. And uh, yes, I hope you've had a restful one and I hope it's been a good one for you and your loved ones. So as we continue uh, with our journey, we're going to learn a little bit more about the harmony of the Gospels. And we're going to look into a couple of uh, the Gospels from Matthew, Mark, Luke and John over the next little while. And we're going to be looking at how that all came together from the Old Testament and the fulfillment in the New Testament. But before we do so, let's just give our time to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, we thank you for your life and your love that you shared through your son, Jesus Christ. And he was born in a manger and those that came to see the miracle, the fulfillment of what had been prophesied so, so many years ago. And as we continue our journey, Lord, we ask the people who hear this message to soften their hearts, let your Holy Spirit work in and through them so that you may be glorified in all things. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Okay, so... Yes, it's been quite a journey. We've been going through the Old Testament, bridging the Old with the New Testament through a couple of an overview of uh, the uh, the Old Testament's talking about the kingdom, the remnant, and then the quiet period, and then obviously the, the birth and the life of Christ. And that's where we're going to pick it up from today. We're going to have a look at uh, the book of Luke. And uh, when we look at the, the, the book of Luke, Luke was one who liked to have orderly accounts on how things progressed through through his gospel and when we look at how the journey began from Bethlehem to Jerusalem we know that he was born in a manger and we know that those came to see him were amazed with the beautiful sight that had uh, been in front of them and that was the birth of Jesus Christ and today we're going to be looking at uh, the glory in the highest and we're going to be taking it from Luke chapter 2 verses 13 to 20 so if you want to follow with me uh, i'll go a little bit earlier i'll start from verse 8 and it's talking about the glory in the highest now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields keeping watch over their flock by night and behold an angel of the lord stood before them and the glory of the lord shone around them and they were greatly afraid then the angel said to them do not be afraid for behold i bring you good tidings of great joy which will be told to all people for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord and this will be the sign to you you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger and suddenly there was uh, with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace goodwill toward men so as it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another let us now go to bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass which the lord had made known to us and they came with haste and found mary and joseph and the babe lying in the manger now when they had seen him they made widely known the saying which was told to them concerning this child and all those who heard it marveled at, at uh, those things which were told by them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen. And it was told to them. A couple of beautiful things that we can pick up there. Firstly, it was glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill, toward men that's what he came to do the second thing that i picked up there was that mary kept a, uh, it says mary kept all things and pondered them in her heart she kept it close to her heart thought about it and just reflected on the goodness of god but when we understand glory what do we mean by glory if we go to john chapter 2 a little bit later on that speaks of how he uh, paved the way or spoke of the the coming messiah but in John chapter 2, we can learn something from this account, which allows us to appreciate what glory is all about. And that was also taking reference to the context of when Jesus turned uh, water into wine. And that was the beginning of the signs that uh, Jesus did later on in his life in Cana and Galilee. And uh, the manifestation of his glory uh, it began and that glory is what we're referring to it's a doxology a paradox uh, and it's originally an opinion or an estimation in which one is held then the word came to don denote the reputation good standing and esteem given to a person 
progress to honor or glory given to peoples, nations, and individuals. The New Testament doxa becomes splendor, radiance, and majesty centered in Jesus. Here, doxa is the majestic, absolute perfection residing in Christ and evidenced by the miracles he performed. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful way to open up this passage of scripture. But let's have a look at the fulfillment for a, a short while. And as we look at the fulfillment, we can return back to Genesis and the fulfillment of the promise, even the promise of Abram. And it said in verses 12, uh, chapter 12, verses 3, he was speaking to uh, Abram and he was going and giving him some instructions. And he said, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And we understand families are so vital and so important, as it was right back then in the days of Abram. And a family, a word wealth of family, can help us understand that it's a family of people, a type, a class, a kind of people, or things, or even species of animals. A group of related individuals, such as a tribe, or a group of related things, such as a category. The main concept is that people, animals, or things share a kingship of, or similarity of, of kind, form, a family, a clan, or a species. Thus, its scope can be as narrow as an immediate family or as broad as a whole nation. God separated Abraham from his family in order to make him and his descendants a great, great nation, and the messianic nation, which will bring salvation to all earth's family. God's got a heart for his people, hasn't he? <laughs> you and me. Anyway, we're going to jump forward a little bit to uh, Isaiah, and we go to Isaiah chapter 9. And in Isaiah chapter 9, we can appreciate the wonderful workings of the prophet in those days, which was also another fulfillment. And if we have a look at Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 in particular. But I'd encourage you to go read the whole of chapter 9 because it speaks of the government of the promised son. But it says in verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now what do we understand about these things? You know, the counselor, mighty God, everlasting father. What about prince of peace? What's peace? If we ever look at a kingdom dynamic and look at uh, peace, which is a Christ, uh, which Christ modeled. Peace comes from God and is evidence of the rule of the Messiah, whose character as the prince of peace waits to instill the settledness of his own rule in our souls. Just as the saving power of his death and resurrection makes it possible for us to have peace with God, be, con be reconciled to him, the indwelling of his life and character through the Holy Spirit's work in our lives is intended to help us learn uh, to abide in the peace of God. Jesus said to his disciples, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Surrender to his will and submission to his word will bring in a rest. As we allow the peace of God to rule in our hearts, that is, to let God's peace act as an umpire, firstly, over decisions that would trouble us, secondly, overruling doubts that would disturb us, and number three, overthrowing the adversary's lies that would defeat or deter us. Perfect peace is available when the heart and mind keep focused on God's promises, His power, and His presence. We just need to trust Him. Beautiful fulfillment that, isn't it? Understanding that peace, you know, Isaiah was one who wrote this book and it was many, many years ago. In fact, let's have a look when it was written. Seven hundred, seven hundred BC to six hundred and ninety BC. That's quite a long time ago, isn't it? Fulfillment accomplished. Let's have a look at the next one. Daniel chapter seven. We can learn a little bit about Daniel. We've learned an overview on the book of Daniel. But in 
chapter 7, verses 10. This is speaking of the vision of the ancient days. And I'll take it again from this uh, verse, but I'd encourage you to read the whole chapter because it speaks of the vision of the four beasts and the vision of the ancient days and his vision that's interpreted. But in verse 10, it says, A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousand ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And the court was seated and the books were opened. What does that tell us about uh, God, the Almighty, who's uh, through Daniel, who had the visions of ancient days, indicating that God is eternal? But it also and helps us appreciate that he's above all things. His throne is above all thrones and from which proceeds both his blessings and judgment. The Messiah's coming will inaugurate a new phase in God's rule upon earth, which we look forward to through the second advent, his second coming. But when Christ was born, he actually brought this into a physical human experience, because as I said before, they didn't understand very much about the Heavenly Father, but the Father sent His Son so that people could physically see what He was like, the nature that He was like, and how He uh, challenged, comforted, rebuked, uh, discipled all those that were with Him. That's all about turning our hearts back to Him. Turning our hearts back to Him so that His desires can be with us as we have peace, and that we are even able to bring in uh, the peace that surpasses all understanding through the Holy Spirit. Let's go back to Isaiah a little bit uh, later on in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 57 verses 19. It's also speaking of healing. Healing the backslider. Sometimes we have uh, walked away from the Lord and we have separated ourselves from his love or from that relationship. But he's always got that heart to restore, that heart to bring back those that have backslidden or turned away. And in verses 19, it says, I create the fruit of the lips, peace. Peace to him who is far off and peace to him who is near, says the Lord. And I will heal him. It's got a great healing power, and Jesus modeled that, didn't he? Healing of the backslide is um, something that when someone comes with a contrite spirit and a heart of repentance, he's there, ready to restore, ready to bring back. And that's because his desire is to be at peace, even with his wayward family. Great love that the Father has for us, isn't it? gives us an opportunity to appreciate that. We can't do anything. We can't buy ourselves into his uh, relationship. We can't buy ourselves into his love. We can't even work our way into his love. It comes by just turning our hearts back to him and allowing him to work in and through our lives. So anyway, um, looking back at that uh, passage of Luke and Mary keeping all these things in our heart, we can uh, have a look at a word wealth that uh, might help us understand a little bit more about what they were talking about in this passage of Scripture. Chapter 2, verses 19. Yeah, when we appreciate the thoughts and the heart of the matter. We can understand that it's a reasoning when she kept it in her heart. It's a reasoning, it's a questioning, it's a consideration, a deliberation, turning thoughts over to the mind, reckoning by mental questions, opinions, designs, and disputes. It's thinking of a man who is deliberating with himself or settling accounts. Through one's acceptance or rejection of Christ, the real thoughts of one's heart towards himself and toward God becomes clear. So without God, our thoughts aren't on him and aren't on his ways which are higher than ours and then we're thinking in the flesh. And that's what I want to encourage each and every one of us through this passage of Scripture. 
Because as we continue leading with this journey of uh, Jesus after he was born and seeing the fulfillment of the Old Testament with the New Testament, we can now turn our attention to that uh, event that happened, which was the circumcision of Jesus, which, as I'll read in chapter 2, verses 21, And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus. The name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. <laughs> wow. So we understand through the uh, accounts of the Old Testament that the procedure or the uh, ritual was to bring people into uh, that outward sign of that covenantal love that God had with his people just want to go through a couple of verses with you to help maybe understand uh, and appreciate some of these texts. In Leviticus chapter 12, it talks about the rituals after childbirth. And I'll read the first three verses. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a woman has conceived and born a male child, then she shall be unclean seven days. As in the days of a customary impurity, she shall be unclean. And then on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. And then I'll let you read a little bit later on. What it's saying there is that in the purification process, after the child was born, the mother had to go through a period of cleansing herself. The first day she was uncleanliness, and then on the eighth day she presented herself as that opportunity to be uh made into their covenantal relationship with God. And that's how they did it. If we go a little bit further back to Genesis chapter 17, it speaks of how the sign of the covenant was made. And in verses uh, 9 through to 11, we can read, God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. So there we go. So that's what they were practicing in Levit Leviticus. They were practicing what was mentioned in, uh, to Abraham in Genesis by God directly. What's that covenant all about? Let's just read about what it says. A covenant is a compact, a pledge, a treaty, agreement. This is one of the most theologically important words in the Bible, appearing more than 250 times in the Old Testament. A berit may be made between individuals, between a king and his people, or by God with his people. Here God's uh, irre irrevocable pledge is that he will be God to Abraham and his descendants forever. The greatest provision of the Abrahamic covenant is the foundation stone of Israel's eternal relationship with God. Truth affirmed by David as found in 2 Samuel chapter 7 verses 24. By the Lord himself in Jeremiah chapter 33 verses 24 to 26. And by Paul in Romans chapter 9 verses 4, chapter 11 verses 2, as well as 29. All other Bible promises are based on this one. But what is the significance of circumcision? It's about the blood. And if we look at a kingdom dynamic, it says that the act of circumcision was required as a sign of the covenant previously established with Abraham. It was not a new covenant, but an external sign that Abraham and his descendants were to execute to show that they were God's covenantal people. The fact that this was performed upon the male reproductive organ had at least a twofold significance. First, the cutting away of the foreskin spoke of the cutting away of fleshly dependence. And two, their hope for the future prosperity uh, and posterity was not to rest upon their own ability. Circumcision was a statement that confidence was being placed in the promise of God and his faithfulness rather than in their own flesh. Seeing things from above, being dependent on God, all those wonderful things that he modeled for us. Christians have a baptism. 
But the baptism doesn't mean anything without faith. And also justification. So when we look at the old, we look at the f what they did on a physical point of view. But in the new, we look at how we do it from a spiritual point of view, just as much as the old is spiritual, because it's a covenantal relationship with, uh, with God. But with the baptism, it's also important that when we get baptized, we make sure that we are doing it by faith and faith alone, but also filled with love and hope. So that we put our faith in the things that are not seen, i.e., God and His Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And we stand on the anchor of hope, which is the rock, Jesus. But we've got to have love. Love is the unconditional uh, thing that uh, casts out all fear, covers a multitude of sins, and allows people to have relationship, not only with the Lord, but with each other. Where there's a lack of love, there's discord. But if we have love, we love much. Okay, let's move on a little bit further. When um, we look at Luke chapter 2, let's go back to Luke chapter 2. And we're appreciating all the accounts of this wonderful testimony. And we're moving now into the um, moving from the circumcision. So we've gone from being uh, born. And the shepherds coming to see him and marveling about what was uh, appearing to them. What about the circumcision, the covenantal relationship, confirmation, Mary becoming clean, Jesus being circumcised. Now we're moving into presenting Jesus in the temple. And we're going to read the first, uh, well, the next few verses, which is taken from chapter 2, verses 22 to 24. And that talks about now when the days of her purification, according to the laws of Moses, were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what it is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, if we go back to Leviticus, I know that we're going back in uh, in time and just having a look at what the accounts say, which allows us to appreciate how the fulfillment still happened. In Leviticus chapter 12, we read verses uh, 1 to 3. And if we go a little bit further, we can uh, read two other verses, which uh, is verses 2 and verses 8. And... When we look at these verses, verses 2 talks about how the woman has been uh, conceived and born, how the woman has conceived and born. And the laws regarding this purification uh, after childbirth emphasize the uh, idea of separation, idea of separation of the unclean from uh, towards the holy. So that's why the mother needed a period of time to become holy again after being unclean after the birth and practicing this holiness code in each aspect of natural life allowed the observation and significance of these customs to be observed and then a little later on it says if she is not able to bring a lamb now this is quite an important thing so i'm going to read this to you the family of jesus did not offer the lamb but two small birds, the offering of these who did not possess the means for such expenses. So they weren't rich. They didn't have these wonderful things that they could offer, but they just offered out of their heart. But they offered the two small birds. Very important that. It's about the thought that counts, isn't it? You know, if you reflect back to our celebration over uh, the birth of Jesus and we uh, shared gifts and the gifts may have been big, they may have been small, but it's really the heart of the matter and the thought that counts. And uh, in this case, Mary was only able to give two doves as opposed to the previous Levitical sessions in terms of offering the lambs. But who was the lamb? <laughs> Jesus was the lamb. She was offering him the sacrifice, the living sacrifice. Remember Abraham? And Isaac, how he stopped, uh, well, the Lord told him to stop sacrificing Isaac. Can we now see how the fulfillment 
because he said, I'll spare him. The sacrifice will come later. The sacrifice was Jesus. And Mary was presenting Jesus with the turtle doves. But Jesus was the lamb, or is the lamb. Think about that over the next three months. Think about how that, uh, that act of obedience, that act of prophetic fulfillment, and that act of love. Wonderful, wonderful testimony that. Deuteronomy tells us how we bring the first of what we have to the Lord so that he may be able to uh, work with it and uh, let it be established in God's love and his time. And when we appreciate Deuteronomy chapter 18, we can uh, see how the portion of the priests and the Levites were uh, instructed. And I'll read from verses 1 through to 4. The priests and the Levites and all the tribes of Levi shall have no part or inheritance with Israel, and they shall eat the offerings of the Lord made by fire and his portion. Therefore they shall have no inheritance amongst their brethren. The Lord is their inheritance, as he said to them. And this shall be the priests due from the people. From those who offer sacrifices, whether it's a bull or a sheep, they shall give to the priests their shoulder, their cheeks and the stomach. The first fruits of your grain and your new wine and your oil and the first of the fleece of your sheep you shall give him. For your Lord your God has given him out of all your tribes to stand to minister in the name of the Lord, him and his sons forever. Let's have a look at that uh, appreciation of the word, the name that we get. Jesus was named. He was named Jesus, but it was prophesied before he was conceived that his name was going to be Jesus. So again, that was a fulfillment. Strong's Accordance tells us that a name, uh, 8034, the name which is Shem, it's a fame, a memorial, a character. And possibly Shem comes from the root such as suggesting marking or branding. Thus a person was named because of something that marked him. Whether physical features or accomplishments he had made or was expected to make, Shem appears more than 800 times in the Old Testament. It's more important being used in the phrase, the name of the Lord, sometimes abbreviated as Hashem. One man blasphemed the name, meaning that he blasphemed the Lord. Thus, in the Judaic tradition, Yahweh, God, is often simply called Hashem. That's a beautiful, beautiful revelation that. All in the name, eh? Hey? All in the name. Wow. Okay, so we move on. And uh, when we understand that the first fruits of our grain and or our wine and our oil is uh, the offering in the name of the Lord, we can appreciate that we offer that as a uh, out of obedience and also out of a sacrifice, give our first fruits, just like we do with tithing. When we tithe, we give our first uh, 10 percent uh, towards the, the house of the Lord then in this case they offered if it wasn't uh, 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 finances it would be something equivalent of so in other words if they have grain they would take 10 percent and offer it through to uh, the, the house of God in the name of the Lord so it's a great learning opportunity for us to appreciate Exodus also gives us quite a, a, a good couple of uh, scriptures that allows us to appreciate um, some of the firstborns that we've been looking at. In, in Exodus chapter 13, we read that the allowance of the firstborn uh, through the consecration is what we're looking at. And if we look at verses 2, 12 and 15, I'll let you read chapter 13 because it speaks of the first. Uh, born consecrated then the Lord spoke to Moses saying consecrate to me all the firstborn whether uh, whatever uh, opens the womb among the children of Israel both of men and beast it is mine <laughs> and then of course it talks about the law of the firstborn and I'll just pick two verses that I'll read for you 11 and 12 and it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites as he swore to you and your fathers and gives it to you that you shall set apart to the Lord all that open the womb that is every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have males shall be the Lord's 
But every firstborn of donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. And all the firstborn of man among your sons shall be redeemed. And then a little later on in verse 15 it says, And it comes to pass, when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, that the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of the men and the firstborn of the beasts. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all males that open the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons are redeemed. Remember that whole account of let my people go? Let my people go. Let my people go. That was taking them from that captivity, slavery, towards the promised land through that wonderful journey through the wilderness. And then it goes on to talk about the wilderness way and how uh, that was so important in their uh, custom and their journey. The sons of God belong to God uh, the sons belong to God in a special way because he spared them in Egypt. And when you read the law of the firstborn, you'll read through the Jewish practices of wearing the uh, phylacteric. And that's the leather boxes and the straps that they used to wear when moving through towards the promised land and still do. They still do that. So let's go back to Luke. Uh, Luke chapter 2 verses 25 to 35 and I'll read and behold there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon and this man was just and devout waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the, the Lord's Christ so he came by the Spirit into the temple and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to, to do for him according to the customs of the law, he took him up in the arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all the people, a light to bring a revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at these things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Again, we've touched on the thoughts and how people ponder the thoughts. But that was Simeon, you know, that was Simeon seeing God's salvation in this, um, in this passage of scripture. But then Anna's, uh, Anna bared witness to the Redeemer, and we pick it up from verses 36. Now well, there was one Anna, a prophetess, a daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of the Asher, and she was of great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers day and night. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. That's a beautiful account, isn't it? What a, what a beautiful, beautiful passage of scripture. I want to take you back to King... 2 Kings chapter 22. Let's go back there. I want to read a kingdom dynamic to you. Talking about the woman and today's prophetic possibilities, which is in this case talking about Huldah. Biblical women. Again, women are so important in God's design. The name Huldah is derived from the Hebrew word Sheled, which means to glide swiftly. Perhaps Hulda's name reflects her quickness of mind and her ability to swiftly and rightly discern the things of God. In any case, the woman was used by God in this fleeting moment in history to voice his judgment and his prophecy and to speak one of the greatest national revivals in history. She is a case study of the character and the potential of a woman who, to, who today will receive the Holy Spirit's fullness and step through whatever open door God provides. It is worth observing how Hilke, the high priest, and Shapran, the scribe, sought out Hilda for God's word of wisdom. 
Clearly she had complete respect and confidence of these men. A lesson in the truth and spiritual influence follows from a spiritual lifestyle, not merely from the presence of spiritual gifts. Acts chapter 2 verses 17 and 18 promises that the church age allows for a proliferation of the Holy Spirit's anointing upon women. Let Hilda's example of respectful, trustful, begetting, forthright living, teach the grounds for wise and effective spiritual ministry. That's wonderful. It's such a beautiful account as to what happened back in the Old Testament in uh, 2 Kings chapter 22, just before 23, which is speaking of Jos uh, Josiah restoring the temple worship or the true worship. And that's something for us to continue reading, even though I have mentioned this before. But we're going to close on um, the book of Matthew. Because as we're journeying from Bethlehem into Jerusalem, we can appreciate that there was a journey that was had and a journey that came that would allow for the Lord to work in and through not only Jesus, but also through the men and women that he called. Now, remember we spoke a little earlier about the shepherds that went to go see this beautiful birth that was uh, Mary and Joseph in the manger and Jesus in, in the, in, in wrapped in, in clothing. A little later on, well, in Matthew chapter 2, after we understand the Matthew account of Christ being born of Mary, we uh, look at chapter 2 verses 1 to 12, and I'll read. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, a wise man from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard of this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring him back and bring the word back to me, that I may come and worship him also. And when they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which he had seen in the east went before him, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. What do we understand about the word prophet? We appreciate that prophets were sent by God and even still to this day. It's to speak. And a prophet, therefore, is primarily a, for, a forth teller. One who speaks forth a divine message that can at times include foretelling future events. Among the Greeks, the prophet was the interpreter of the divine will. And this idea is dominant in biblical usage. Prophets are therefore specially endowed with insights into the counsels of the Lord and serve as his spokesman. Prophecy is a gift of the Holy Spirit, which the New Testament encourages believers to exercise, although at a level of difference from those with, within the prophetic office, as found in Ephesians chapter 4. But it also mentions dreams in verses uh, 12. And that's also part of... Uh, the message. Remember Joel spoke that the young men and the old men shall see visions and dream dreams. The kingdom dynamic that we can learn here is that a prophetic dream and visions are New Testament that opens with a burst of dreams, visions and angelic visitations and prophecies and closes with John's revelation on the Isle of Patmos as found in Revelations. Throughout our many encounters with God in dreams and visions, yet neither Jesus nor the apostles give any particular precept concerning the phenomena 
of dreams or visions. This is somewhat enig enigmatic in that while the Bible does not teach about dreams and visions in any systematic manner, yet by citing so many significant examples, it validates their existence and use by God as a means of communicating to people. Very important that message for us to understand, isn't it? It's dreams and visions. Now, I just want to uh, go back and finish off on one passage of Scripture. Speaking of dreams and visions. Joseph, you know, he was entrusted with great things. Because he, he served humbly, faithfully, honorably. And when we look at Joseph's dreams of greatness, there was a time in history that we can learn how this may have affected positively and negatively not only the future of the nation of Egypt back in those days and their release into the promised land. But let's have a, a read through uh, Genesis chapter 37 in closing. Now Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers, and the lad was with his sons of Bula and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than his children, because he was the son of his old age. Also he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, Please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There they were, binding sheaves in the field. Then, behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And indeed your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, You shall indeed reign over us, or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I have your, uh, and your brothers indeed come and bow down uh, to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So let's leave that there um, and let's have a look at a kingdom dynamic being rooted into a dream. That's also understanding when God speaks to us through the visions or dreams that he has placed within us, each and in individual within us. We may not understand what God has put in to the other person or given them that vision or given them that dream. And as with Mary who pondered things in her heart, so did, um, so did his father. His father kept the matter in mind. Anyway, the Hebrew word for had a dream means to bind firmly. Joseph became firmly bound up in the dream that God had given him. And dreams that are from God are spiritual experiences that root deep, that root deep in our hearts, never to be forgotten. Joseph had a dream. But perhaps we could more accurately say that the dream had Joseph. The dream sustained him through all that had happened to him over the years. Like Moses, he endured as seeing him who is invisible. That's that faith. That's that walking by faith. That's holding on to that dream that God has given you. And going deeper into his word. Matthew 6.33 Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness shall be added unto you. But the message that we're closing off on is that we all have dreams. We all have opportunities to live out those dreams that God has placed on our hearts. Sometimes those dreams and those thoughts and those visions are kept in our hearts like it was with Mary as well as, uh, as, well as um, uh, Isaac. Jacob, sorry, not Isaac. And he held it. He held the matter in mind. And just as Jesus did when he did his ministry, he held some things close to his heart, very close to his heart. And that was the truth, the truth of love, the truth of his father, his Abba father. But it was the unconditional love that Jesus ministered 
modeled and discipled as well as shepherding because he's a true and good shepherd. So as we close off today, let's just hold this beautiful passage of Scripture, harmonizing the Gospels of Luke and going now into uh, Matthew. And, uh, we'll lead more into Matthew. We're taking that journey from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. And we're understanding the good and uh, wonderful things that was laid before him. And as we continue with our journey and our messages, let's hold him close to us. Let's invite him into our lives. Let's ask him to fill us with the Holy Spirit as we continue journeying and learning more about him through the Gospels and the harmonizing of them, as well as the Old Testament, because as we know, it's that bridging. So my encouragement for us all this, this uh, coming week, and we'll have another um, sermon this afternoon, let's hold these things close to our heart, just like Jacob did, just like Mary did and Jesus did. And let's continue searching, going deeper, deeper into his word, finding out what the Lord is saying to us during this time and this season, so that we may be able to be a blessing to others. Remember, we have that vulnerability like Jesus had. We have that servant leadership that he modeled. But we've got the Holy Spirit living inside in each and every single one of us that allows us to walk confidently in his faith, in his hope, and in his love. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today, Lord. We, oh Lord, we just love you. We just adore you. We want to know more about you. And we glorify your name, your holy name. So, Lord, as we continue journeying through the scriptures, Lord, help us learn more about you. Help us be established in your word. Help us get those dreams and visions from you by prayer, by worship, and by reading your word. So, Heavenly Father, as we close off today, Lord, Touch the hearts, touch the minds, and touch the spirits of each person who hears this message. May it be to all your glory, and we give you all the glory forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we'll continue a little later on, and we're going to be looking at another passage of Scripture. Let me find out what it is going to be. Um, I'll keep it a secret. Join us at 3 o'clock, and then we'll take it from there. Sending you lots of love, and chat soon. Cheerio.